This episode of the History Guy is brought to you by REC Watches. The Victoria Cross is Britain's highest award for bravery in wartime. The National Army Museum notes that it requires an act of extreme bravery in the face of the enemy and has achieved an almost mythical status, with its recipients often being revered as heroes. Up until 1991, Australians were eligible for the Victoria Cross, and according to the Australian War Memorial, 101 Australians have received the award. Among those was William Ellis Newton of the Royal Australian Air Force, a 23-year-old pilot whose brash flying had earned him the nickname Firebug, and his history that deserves to be remembered. I want to show you something very special. This is an REC X4009 in Centra Black. It is by any standard a fine timepiece. It's a certified Swiss-made self-winding timepiece with luminescent hands, indexes, and rails, with a top glass of sapphire crystal with three layers of anti-reflective coating and a three-piece case of 316L stainless steel. But this watch is much more than just a very fine timepiece. This watch is a piece of history. Flight Lieutenant Patterson Hughes, DFC, is recognized as one of the Ace of Aces from the Battle of Britain and is Australia's most decorated pilot from this event. In 2020, wreckage from Flight Lieutenant Hughes's Mark 1A Spitfire, number X4009, was recovered, and the plane is currently undergoing a complete restoration overseen by the Hunter Fighter Collection Charity Organization. And now here's the great part. Fuselage aluminum, or aluminium if you prefer, unfit for the ongoing restoration, was supplied to REC watches and has subsequently been reforged as the 6 o'clock subdial of every X4009 wristwatch. And due to the patina of using recycled materials, every watch will look visually unique. This means that you will be literally carrying a unique part of the plane that distinguishes itself in one of the greatest air battles in history. The X4009 collection is a series of three distinct watch models, all made with aluminum from the Mark 1A Spitfire X4009. And the overall design of all three color tone watches mimics the watches worn by the pilots of the World War II era, the so-called Dirty Dozen watches, as well as the X4009 aircraft. And if you purchase one of these extraordinary wristwatches, a part of every sale is dedicated towards the HFC Restoration Fund. Or, in other words, X4009 customers will actively be a part of restoring the X4009 aircraft back to her former glory. So check out the link in the description to discover the entire X4009 collection and take part in getting her back to where she belongs, the skies. Customers can now take advantage of a 25% pre-order discount on the next production batch with expected delivery in October of this year. The Royal Australian Air Force, or RAAF, was in a difficult position at the start of the Second World War. The Anzac Portal, a history site by the Australian Government Department of Veteran Affairs, wrote in 2008, The RAAF was barely prepared for war. Formed in 1921, it was the youngest and smallest of the armed services. But the force had been expanding in the 1930s, as war in Europe had appeared increasingly likely. Part of the expansion was a reserve force. These forces went back to the beginning of the RAAF. Major General James Gordon Legg, chief of the general staff, had first proposed the creation of an air branch in 1919 under the idea that it would be mainly composed from citizen forces with a portion of permanent troops, the latter to provide for the instruction of the force and the maintenance of the equipment. The Australian Air Force was formed as an independent service in 1901, but it wasn't until 1936 that reserve units were actually formed under the title Citizen Air Force, or CAF. On April 20th, 1936, two CAF squadrons, numbers 21 and 22, were formed, each composed of about two-third part-time CAF men and one-third of the Permanent Air Force, or PAF. The two squadrons were outfitted with largely outdated planes, such as the Hawker Demon and the de Havilland Gypsy Moth. The RAAF webpage writes that on 1 July, the new CAF units changed their title by adding the name of the capital city on which they were based, becoming number 21, City of Melbourne Squadron, and number 22, City of Sydney Squadron. Despite the effort to expand, the Anzac Portal writes that at the start of World War II, the RAAF had just 3,489 personnel and no modern combat aircraft. Still, with the outbreak of war in 1939, Australia quickly offered to send six squadrons to Britain 
This was a significant commitment. At the time, the RAAF had only 12 squadrons altogether. The Australian role became quickly. Hundreds of Australians were already in Britain, training or serving with the Royal Air Force, and men from one squadron, number 10 squadron, had already been sent to the United Kingdom in July, tasked with taking ownership of nine short Sunderland flying boats. The South Australian Aviation Museum writes that the aircraft would then be ferried back to Australia to patrol and reconnoiter the nation's maritime environs. Such was the plan. However, ongoing political uncertainty finally erupted into World War II on September 1, 1939. The upshot was that Number 10 Squadron remained in the United Kingdom, following an appeal from Britain to the Australian government. The RAAF subsequently sent an additional two officers and 183 airmen. The webpage of the RAAF explains the two groups now formed a complete squadron and thus became the first Air Force unit of any British Dominion to be on active service. It was clear that the RAAF would have to expand quickly, and the key to that was called the Empire Air Training Scheme, or EATS. The RAAF webpage writes that in December 1939, Australia's Minister for Air, James Fairbairn, signed an agreement in Ottawa, Canada, which committed the RAAF to participating in the Empire Air Training Scheme during World War II. The idea of training air crew on an empire-wide basis had been proposed by Britain in September and accepted by Australia the following month. Under EATS, Australia undertook to train 11,000 aircrew each year until March 1943. It was an ambitious plan. Prior to EATS, the RAAF had been training just 50 pilots a year. Facilities were built throughout Australia. Among those trained was a young aviation enthusiast named William Ellis Newton. A 1943 edition of the Sydney New South Wales Sun explained that lanky 10-year-old Bill Newton, son of a Melbourne dentist, fell in love with airplanes. He lived for them, dreamed about them, asked his mother anxiously, Do you like airplanes? A skilled athlete, in 1938, 19-year-old Newton signed up with the 6th Battalion of the Royal Melbourne Regiment as a private in a machine gun section. At the time, the Australian military was designed around a defense force, and the 6th RMR was a militia unit. As a result, when the war started, the men of the 6th RMR found themselves unable to go to war, as provisions of the 1903 Defense Act prohibited sending the militia to fight outside of Australian territory. But Newton wanted action. Moreover, he wanted to fly, and the Empire Air Training Scheme gave him the opportunity. The Australian War Memorial webpage explains, In spite of some reluctance on the part of his mother, Newton enlisted in the RAAF on 5 February 1940 as an air cadet after he had been discharged from the 6th RMR two days earlier. The memorial writes, however, that despite earning his wings and being promoted to flying officer, Newton was constantly frustrated in his efforts to get an operational posting. While Eats had given him the opportunity to become a pilot, the program also required a large number of pilot trainers. The War Memorial writes that he spent much of his early service life as a flight instructor in Australia. Then came December. Virtual War Memorial Australia writes that the RAAF campaign in the Southwest Pacific began from 7 December 1941 until 15 August 1945. When Japan entered the war, the RAAF, like the rest of the military, was wrong-footed. It had precious few squadrons scattered throughout the island archipelagos to the north. Most of the enlisted and training strength of the RAAF was either in Europe, or the Mediterranean, or at various points in the training continuum of the Empire Air Training Scheme, the aim of which was to prepare and train crew to enable RAF operations in northwest Europe. The Virtual War Memorial Australia writes that in the immediate term, the RAAF went to war with what it had, which wasn't much. Desperate requests were relayed to the British, although it was apparent that they were overwhelmed with their own problems and had nothing to spare. Similarly, the Americans, with their Pacific fleet of smoking ruin in Pearl Harbor, were now setting their minds on the task of equipping and manning a Pacific War effort, although they had simultaneously declared war on Germany, where it was agreed that the main effort would go first. The Japan entry into the war had offered new challenges to the RAAF, but it would offer an opportunity to Bill Newton. The Australian War Memorial explains on 1 April 1942, he was promoted to Flight Lieutenant, and on 9 May was finally given an operational posting with No. 22, City of Sydney, Squadron. The Australian War Memorial writes that 22 Squadron's first assignments of the Second World War were as a training unit covering Army support and towing targets for anti-aircraft practice. But Virtual War Memorial Australia explains that the pace of the war had actually offered No. 22 Squadron some of the rare modern equipment available 
The RAAF gained some initial respite with consignments of aircraft intended for the Dutch in their colonial outpost in modern-day Indonesia, diverted and said to Australia as the Dutch defenses collapsed. Included among these were modern Douglas A-20 Boston light bombers. The Douglas A-20 was a twin-engine light bomber with a crew of three and a wingspan of 63 feet, three and a half inches. The A-20 was called the Havoc by the Americans, but in Australia they were called the Boston. Newton joined the squadron in May. The son described him as aged 23, six foot two inches of fearless singing Australian. He reportedly so loved singing that he always sang when he went into action. In his book, Bravest, How Some of Australia's Greatest War Heroes Won Their Medal, aviation historian Robert Macklin writes that Newton was the epitome of the dashing young hero and the model of Errol Flynn. A fellow flyer referred to him as a big, brash, likable man who could drink most of us under the table, was a good pilot, good at sports, and had a way with the girls. Number 22 Squadron flew from Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, located on the shore of the Gulf of Papua. Port Moresby had been saved from a Japanese invasion in May when a Japanese landing force had been turned back in the naval battle of the Coral Sea. As the last significant bastion on the island, Port Moresby was developed into an important Allied base, a jumping-off point for the campaign to retake the island. Flying with No. 22 Squadron, Macklin writes that from the first sortie, he was recognized as the most relentless fighter in the group. Over the next 10 months, he attacked enemy positions in his Boston bomber in 52 sorties, many in the most hazardous circumstances. The Australian War Memorial writes that he quickly gained a fearless reputation for avoiding standard evasive maneuvers so that he could make a straight-line run at his targets. An examination revealed that 90% of his flights were made under heavy fire. The London Gazette wrote in 1943, Flight Lieutenant Newton served with No. 22 Squadron, Royal Australian Air Force, in New Guinea from May 1942 to March 1943 and completed 52 operational sorties. Throughout, he displayed great courage and an iron determination to inflict the utmost damage on the enemy. His splendid offensive flying and fighting were attended with brilliant success. Disdaining evasive tactics when under the heaviest fire, he always went straight to his objectives. He carried out many daring machine gun attacks on enemy positions, involving low flying over long distances in the face of continuous fire at point-blank range. The website Kokoda Historical explains that this tactic proved to be very effective, and Newton's targets were often left in flames. It was this tendency to leave his targets in flames that earned him the squadron nickname, Firebug. Kokoda Historical writes that in early March 1943, their targets were in the Salamua area, a narrow isthmus on the northeastern coastline of Papua New Guinea. And enough sorties were carried out that the enemy gunners had become familiar with the machines of 22nd Squadron, and they with the placement and accuracy of the various guns. The crews of the guns and the aircraft became so familiar with each other that it was almost become a personal duel between them. Because the attacks were often carried out at very low levels, the gun crews were able to recognize the pilots of the Bostons, especially Newton, who habitually wore a blue cricketeer's cap. The Australian War Memorial describes one of the raids. On 16 March, he dived for over half a mile long through intense and accurate anti-aircraft fire to bomb his target at the lowest possible altitude. Though his plane was considerably damaged by Japanese anti-aircraft fire, he successfully destroyed buildings and two 40,000-gallon fuel storage tanks. The Gazette continues, Although his aircraft was crippled, with fuselage and wing sections torn, petrol tanks pierced, main planes and engines seriously damaged, and one of the main tires flat, Flight Lieutenant Newton managed to fly it back to base and make a successful landing. He would be called to make another attack two days later. Kokoda History writes, The squadron was briefed to attack the Salamua Isthmus again this time aiming for a building which had not been destroyed in the previous attack and was situated right next to the anti-aircraft battery. Even though he'd barely escaped with his crew intact on the 16th, Newton flew the mission, his 52nd, with no outward signs of uneasiness and attacked from only 50 feet this time to make sure that they wouldn't have to come back. He scored a direct hit on the building and the battery scored one on him, turning his Boston into a fireball. The remaining crews in the attack saw the crippled machine turn and fly low along the shoreline, trying to put distance between them and the enemy, finally ditching in the sea on a reef near the shore. The Gazette writes that two members of the crew were able to extricate themselves and were seen swimming to the shore, but the gallant pilot is missing, 
According to other air crews who witnessed the occurrence, his escape hatch was not open and his dinghy was not inflated. Without regard to his own safety, he had done all that man could do to prevent his crew from falling into enemy hands. The Sun reported that just before the mission he had written his last letter to his mother, Minnie. He wrote, Should anything happen, I want you to know. I am very happy. On October 20th, 1943, the Grafton New South Wales Examiner reported, The King, on the advice of Australian ministers, conferred the Victoria Cross on an Australian Air Force man, Flight Lieutenant William Ellis Newton. The citation for Britain's highest award for acts of bravery in wartime read, Flight Lieutenant Newton's many examples of conspicuous bravery have rarely been equaled and will serve as a shining inspiration to all who follow him. Newton was the only Australian airman to receive the award for actions in the Southwest Pacific, and the only Australian airman to receive the award while serving with an RAAF squadron. The medal was awarded in a ceremony to Minnie. She told the son, What Bill said is true. He would die happy. I know how he died. He died singing. But the fortunes of war are not always so kind. In late 1943, a diary was found on a dead Japanese soldier. The diary divulged that Newton and his wireless operator, Flight Sergeant John Lyon, had survived the crash. Taken prisoner, they had faced interrogation before Newton was returned to the officer who had captured him, who had been given the special honor of executing the prisoner. The translated diary described his last moments. He is apparently resigned. The precaution is taken of surrounding him with guards with fixed bayonets, but he remains calm. He even stretches out his neck and is very brave. The unit commander has drawn his favorite sword. It glitters in the light and sends a cold shiver down my spine. First he touches the prisoner's neck lightly with the sword. Then he raises it overhead. The prisoner closes his eyes for a second, and at once the sword sweeps down. His remains were recovered, where laundry marks positively identified him. The diary entry was reported in the Australian press, and it shocked the nation, but Newton's name was not included at the time, for fear that the news would negatively affect the morale of his squadron. The Newton family were represented in all three arms of Australia's military forces during the Second World War. Newton's brother Lindsay served as a dentist with the Army Medical Corps, and his brother John served as a surgeon with the Royal Australian Navy. Bill's nephew Nick told the Australian War Museum in 2022, I've been trying to imagine what makes someone like Bill, just 23 years old, to be able to do what he did. And I just marvel at it. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.